Trading psychology or statistical edge? Which is more important? Should we as traders be focused more on our strengths or our weaknesses? Market efficiency, the Kelly criterion, and trading vowel. All this today and more on the Futures Radio Show podcast with senior financial engineer at Hull Tactical, Ewan Sinclair. Futures Radio Show is sponsored by CME Group. They are the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. For new show notifications, please subscribe to Futures Radio Show podcast on iTunes, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or Stitcher. This show is also sponsored by Trading Technologies, RJO Futures, and FTSE Russell. The Russell 2000 is a key benchmark for small cap U.S. stocks. Be sure to check out the E-mini Russell 2000 futures symbol, RTY, and micro E-mini Russell 2000 futures symbol, M2K. To learn more about FTSE Russell and their products, please visit FTSERussell.com. I actually want to get into a little bit about something that you and I, we don't agree on, and I want to just have that little discussion before we talk about the book, and and most people listening to this already know that I believe heavily into trading psychology and how I believe that that's so important because I think that anybody could learn charts, anybody could learn fundamentals, and I went through this in my career when I was first developing my strategy that it was like, okay, um, I, I feel like I have something that's good here. And then when it came down to the execution of it, uh, I felt that I just needed to get better at that. I needed to get better at, at, at psychology, uh, just like handling being a trader. I just think that there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of art that goes into it. And you actually feel a little bit differently. You're on the other side. Okay. I am fundamentally a stats guy. And because of that, I'm very much into the idea that if you can't express it in numbers, and you can't measure it, it may still exist, but it's not important. I only believe intangibles become important if they affect something tangible. So, you know, in the old, in the baseball argument, I'm very much a stats guy rather than a team chemistry kind of guy. I believe in the numbers. I don't believe in scouts. But I think it's interesting, something you said there you said you believe in psychology is more important, but then you said because anyone can learn. So that's sort of where I am as well. It's I think edge, positive expectation in a trade is the most important because like you said, anyone can learn it fine, but you have to learn it. If you don't have a trade with positive expected value, you can have the best psychology in the world and you'll still lose money. Having said that, I do think psychology is important and bad psychological makeup can wreck the best edge there is as well. So edge, I think is most important, but I don't really, we could have this argument and go back and forth forever. Um, and I'm, I'm not really interested anymore so much in convincing other people that I'm right. I want to sort of put out my ideas and other people can sort of take them, take them and use them and, you know, work from them um you know you just can't convince some people of some things and maybe that maybe i'm not right you know well yeah, that's what i like <laughs> about that you. at this point in my life that's what i like about you and that's what i like about your books i mean you just get right to the point i mean you don't fool around you talk about you know, i could tell that you're you know a numbers guy just from like, reading your previous book and you know going back to that discussion is what's more important right and and i think that yes everybody needs to have some statistical edge everybody needs to have some s sort of strategy right that's structured but i believe right. you, that you can't make money playing with, the lottery yeah right? you can't just go in there and be like hey you know i have I, my psychology is great you know you can't go in there it's like i look at it if, look at it this way so you have tiger woods right who i think is one you would look at who is probably got the best head on his shoulders when it comes to golf, but he's got to learn how to swing first. Like he needs the fundamentals. I mean, when it comes down to it, he's just the best at the moment 
at seizing the moment. I, I, I look at that a lot as a trader, right? Because it, if you don't have those basic fundamental skills of understanding, you know, the technicals and the fundamentals, then really you can't <laughs> – a good trading psychology doesn't matter. I'm just agreeing. Like Tiger Woods, his psychology is wonderful. But if my psychology was as good as his, he's still going to beat me by 20 strokes, right? Because his technicals are there. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, in baseball, you can be the best clubhouse guy in the world, but if you can't hit the ball, you're not going to be in the majors. So given you're in the majors, then being a good clubhouse guy is great. So... It's kind of interesting. Whenever we have this, we people always start off like this is a, an argument, and we normally kind of end up agreeing. Yeah, um, I can see that. Let's let's just take as a given for a second that psychology, trading psychology, is really important, right? Traders don't do anything to get better at it. You know, it's kind of knowing that you're a weak person isn't going to make you strong. Knowing that is the first step. And then you go to the gym and then you work on it. But traders like, ah, oh, man, I've got to get more disciplined. And they sort of sit there and try and will themselves into a state of discipline. And that, that, that just doesn't work. They've got to work on that skill like they'd work on anything else. And I just don't see it. I don't see traders going to psychologists. I see them reading garbage, looking at YouTube videos, you know, following <laughs> someone on Twitter. But you've got to really work at it with someone who really knows what they're talking about. And I just – so I don't know if traders really believe psychology is important as much as they say it is or whether they just haven't – maybe a lot of traders just don't do any work. I don't know. <laughs> People look for easy answers, right? Uh, you know, I, I think – Nowadays, you have really two different types of traders. You have the people that really put the time in, and you have the people that open up the account the next day are trading. You know, a lot of people call them the Robin Hooders or whatever, right? They come in, they look for the quick buck, and they either quit or they eventually find themselves to become like the other person. I mean, if you if you're always finding in the middle, in my in my experience. You're either going to be one of the other two, the person who does it for a short period of time and quits or the person who becomes devoted and this is what you want to do. I mean, the market weeds everybody out. And, you know, I don't I don't know in my experience that I have been around too many traders that have been doing this for a long time that are, they haven't found the full commitment to to maybe some work harder than others and in, in different facets. But I think they all work hard in in trying to get better. And I think that I, I want to stay kind of back to where we were talking about whether or not this is an argument to where we both agree. And I think that we definitely do. A, 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 I think we do agree because it's, it's like, I think once you get to the point to where you have, have found the strategy, then I think the psychology and actually even, I think actually more important than psychology is execution. And, and that's just getting really good at executing your strategy unless it's automated, you know, because that's something else that I I talk a lot about is that it's not just about, and I kind of think this kind of blends with psychology execution. You know, being able to to recognize your strengths and your weaknesses of not only yourself but your strategy, and then being able to execute at the highest level. Um, and I think that's really I think the better executor of the same strategy, the person who has the better psychology and the better execution skills, will supersede any numbers. So uh, th that's also where I look at it and say it's it, – the whole thing is a process to get to the point. But then once you get to the point of the numbers, in order to excel beyond them, beyond the numbers, that's where execution and psychology become more important to me. Well, I, I, think, I think you can put numbers on the execution as well. But I do agree – but I think it's a separate part to the strategy. It's not the core. Um. But something you said was really interesting about working on your strengths and weaknesses or recognizing them. I think trading is something where working on your weaknesses is the wrong way to go. Hmm. Um, I think you should concentrate on your strengths because a lot of a lot of things in trading are quite transient. And 
I hate it when I hear a trader who's like, oh, I've got this nice strategy. It wins this. It's got this winning percentage. It's great. I'm just keeping it small, trying to grind away. I'm like, you're the dumbest person in the world. You should be trading that as big as you possibly can because it won't last. And I think you shouldn't try to work on weaknesses. You should try and exploit strengths. So it's not like, oh, your, your example about Tiger Woods. Golf is a game where you should you get the best bang for your buck by working on your weaknesses because you have to do everything. You have to drive, you have to chip, you have to putt. But in basketball, there are plenty of guys who've had great NBA careers and all they could do was shoot. You know, it's like you, there are guys in the Hall of Fame who couldn't defend at all, who just didn't bother defending, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of think trading's like that. It's like work on your strengths, acknowledge your weaknesses, and try and put yourself in situations where they're not the important thing, but then really work on your strengths. I think this is something, once again, where it's like, I, I think initially it sounds like maybe I would disagree with that, but then after hearing you explain it, I agree with it. And, and, and hear it from my perspective. So I'm an over trader. That's a weakness of mine, period. Okay. I find myself in my own fast markets like nobody's business. So I'm somebody who is quick to pull the trigger. I find a support and resistance level that I like on my strategy and I just want to trade it because I like to trade, right? It's one of those things where that has hurt me way more than it's helped me. So I have worked on putting confirmations in and just getting mentally stronger to stop myself from hitting the button. So to me, I look at it and go back to where, okay, I'm recognizing myself. I'm recognizing the market environment. To me, that's psychology. You know, my execution, I look at it and go, this is not a high the highest probability trade that you have, you shouldn't probably be taking this one because of the environment or anything else that's going on. So I look, I, it goes back to where I have to work on that because that's a weakness for me. You know, and, and my strengths are I press winners great. So it's like my, a lot of times in my past, I have made up for my mistakes because if all of a sudden I get hot and everything's working for me, I have no problem trading more and more aggressively, and then it makes up for some of my mistakes that I made along the way, and I end up pushing through and making money. You know, and it, it covers a lot of the losses that I had along the way. But and that works at once again until it doesn't, because if you're tra <laughs> if I'm not trading good and I'm over trading for periods of time, I mean, I look back. It's hard to even remember what what year it was at this point. Maybe it was I know it was one of the years in the last. I know this last year and a half have been pretty busy, but prior to that, I think there was a good six to eight months where it was slow, and I was just grinding myself out. And I'm going, man, this has got to stop. I had a it was just a drawdown I couldn't get out of for months, and it was because I I was over trading. I recognized it early. I stopped when it got busy. I made it all back, which was months of losing in a very short period of time. But if I didn't stop when I realized that it was happening to me and I didn't work on that weakness, it, the drawdown would have been mu much bigger and longer. Yeah. I think the most important thing there is not working on it, but recognizing it. Um, and then how, how you deal with it. it. If you don't know you have a problem, you can't do anything about it. But I've got, I know one of my big weaknesses is I, I'm better at exploring than exploiting. Um, so I tend to, I tend to tr get distracted with new ideas and trade them instead of concentrating on the ones that really work. And the way I deal with that is I kind of recognize it's something I'm going to do. And I put a tiny little bit of my account into those trades. I don't try to stop doing them. But if I'm only putting 5% of my account into them, best case scenario, I get a lot of confidence in them and I can move them to the, the big account. Worst case scenario is I lose a little bit of money and I've stopped myself sabotaging the rest of my business. Um, so I've kind of got to the point where I'm just like, look, I'm not going to change that. That's just me. But, you know, knowing it's just me means I can put myself in a situation where it's not going to kill me. Yeah, I, I think we're just we're both talking is from our experiences and. Everyone knows I say this all the time that trading is personal, and I think it really what it it does come down to is is self awareness, right? Know who you are, and this is why, like you, when you say your strengths, your strengths are in the numbers, your strengths are you know understanding yourself and and just what kind of strategy you need to build around you, and also to, to give you that confidence. I think that 
I don't think we talk about confidence enough as well is because all of this ties into what I think is what creates that whole trader is having all those things working on a level where you're confident and, and you're working on getting better at all those things. I think it goes, kind of goes back to where you said, you know, focusing on your strengths and working on them. And, and that just takes so much time that I think the, the newest group of traders coming in, do they know that? Do they know how much time this takes? I mean, I'm 20 plus years into this and I look at it and go, man, I'm working on this still. It just is, it's just one of those things. It's a, uh, it, it's a time thing. Yeah. I think if you ever think you've reached a point where you can stop learning, you're, you're done toast because everything, no matter how you trade, everything's changing all the time. So there's never an end point here. You know, you never, you never get it. No. You, you get to the point where you can stay, stay in the game, but what you're doing now can't be the same thing you were doing five years ago. It just won't be working. No, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, it's, it's a, uh, if everyone looks at my, my Twitter page, it says trading is a journey of oneself and that journey just continues <laughs> and continues and continues. And I want to talk more about your strengths. And we talked about the book a little bit and it was funny, you know, I, I saw that message on LinkedIn that uh, you were putting out that your book was coming out. And funny enough, actually somebody on YouTube must have searched your name and then went and found an old show that we had done years ago. And then they put out a question and they're looking forward to your book. I can't remember who the person was. I just actually copied and pasted this off of YouTube from our, from our old um, podcast. And it said, so I'm going to read you this question. I think this is going to spark a pretty good conversation is, can you please ask him about market efficiencies? Why can people like him still beat these efficient markets? I have a comment about that. Uh, <laughs> efficient markets uh, in, a, in a moment. But in addition, can you ask him about the volatility models he uses to model VIX? I read many options books and most are awful. Either the author doesn't know much about options or doesn't know a lot uh, or knows a lot but can't explain well. Uh, Sinclair is extremely knowledgeable and explain uh, and simplify. And so before I let you go in and, and chime in on that, I mean, I want to kind of start with market efficiencies. I, I look at it like this. If the market is so efficient, then there wouldn't be any opportunities, right? If the market is always priced so good, then there wouldn't be opportunities. I'm someone who believes that the market isn't always efficient, and that's where the opportunity is. Yeah, okay. So I don't – no one originally who came up with the efficient market hypothesis ever said markets were perfectly efficient. Um, so anyone who's like, I'm going to blame Twitter again because you can't have any nuanced <laughs> conversation on Twitter. Anyone who's like the efficient market hypothesis is garbage probably doesn't really understand what anyone used it for. It's just an organizing principle. It's a lot more of a good principle than it was before we had it. Um, and the markets, if you don't respect them enough to think they're really hard to beat, you're the one who's going to fail. So that's the trader's definition of market efficiency. Market, it's really hard to make money. It's not impossible, but it's really hard. So that's sort of where I see the efficient market hypothesis. It's an approximation that lets you do no arbitrage pricing of derivatives. And it sort of, it can give you the right amount of respect you need. If you think of the market as your opponent, you've got to respect it and you've got to understand it. Traders, we're going to pause for 30 seconds and we'll be right back. A question I constantly get is what platform do I use to trade futures? Well, I use TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. Learn more at tryttnow.com. RJO is a long-standing brokerage firm with personal broker relationships to help you learn and trade futures. To learn more, please visit rjofutures.com. I look at the market in a way of, for me on a personal level, is I, here's the information I have in front of me, and I look at it and say, I'm going to do my best with the tools that I have to execute it. I almost don't even look at it as myself versus the market in a way. I just look at it as, here's the information I have. These, the, these are the tools that I use, 
And I look at it and go, it's really a battle of, of me executing them than it is me trying to figure out uh, a battle between myself and the market because I, I just I don't I don't want to have that to where if I'm wrong I feel like the market's beating me I I don't want to have that that thought in my mind I want to be like okay I was wrong in my decision making understand look at what happened remember the situation learn from it move on I don't want to look like it look at it as uh, I beat the market today or the market beat me yeah I think that's sort of a personality thing as well. I mean, I, maybe I should think that way, but I just don't, you know, and I'm not, it's not like a battle, literally to me, it's kind of like a sports event. You know, I, I win, I lose, it's not going to kill me either way. And I enjoy playing the game and usually I come out ahead. So that's, you know, it's kind of like going back to, you know, know yourself. That's just sort of what, how I think. And I know a lot of traders think differently, and if that works for them, that's great. What markets are you primarily trading? And then talk to us a little bit about what you believe your edge is. Okay, all I've really traded for the last, I don't know, 10 years has been index vol either through the VIX complex or through S&P options. You know, I mean, the ETF options as well. Um I think originally my edge came from statistical analysis and time series models that predicted volatility. Um, a lot of tra people trade volatility because they think it's predictable, but you've still got to do the work of predicting it. You know, you can't just sort of say, for example, one of the worst ideas ever is like, I'm just going to sell iron condors because the market usually doesn't move that much and I'll collect the premium. I mean, that just doesn't work all the time. I mean, it works a lot of the time, but you've got to understand the weaknesses in that strategy so you know when it's likely to work and when it isn't. Because if you just do it all the time, all you're doing is racking up costs. You'll eventually lose money. Um, so that was where my edge was. Where my edge now mainly is, I think, sort of gets back to that question of how you can continue to beat the markets and market inefficiencies. I don't think I really trade inefficiencies. Um, I think there are two ways to beat the markets. And by that, I mean, you know, have a significant positive return greater than the equity markets or whatever your benchmark is. Yeah. I think you can discover real inefficiencies, which are like little overlooked things, little wrinkles that either other people can't trade or they just haven't noticed yet. I mean, that's kind of like the whole thing about finding a $20 bill on the, on the sidewalk, right? Back when we used to have cash. Now, if you find that every Saturday morning outside of a bar, that's probably an inefficiency. And what's happened is someone's walked out of that bar when they were drunk and dropped it. Now, that, that's the sort of thing that isn't going to last because people are eventually going to notice that. And it's only there because you've noticed it first. What I do is I largely trade risk premier, which I'm taking on the other side of people who want to get out of certain risks. Now, the, the classic one is, you know, selling index volatility, which I don't do all the time. But when you do, you're essentially selling insurance to other people. And there's money there as well, because that premium is often, not always, because I people tend to be able, people tend to have trouble recognizing the difference between often and always. But that tends to be mispriced. People tend to pay too much for insurance. And that's the equivalent of, you find the $20 bill, but it's sitting on the middle of the expressway. And other people see it, but they don't want to take the risk of going to get it. But I'm like, okay, I think I can run across the expressway and pick it up. And I think I can see the moments when I can do that when the traffic's not too bad. And so that is the sort of trade that I do now. I recognize when there are these risk premier, and I work out when they're overpriced. And... I think it's important to recognize if the trade you're doing is an inefficiency or a risk premium, you trade them differently. If it's an inefficiency, you should trade it as big as you possibly can while recognizing it won't last. 
if it's a risk premier, that's the sort of thing you can make the background, like the core strategy that you can build on. It'll change over time. Nothing's constant. But you can, if it's some, if it's a risk premium and it's based on real risks that you think are mispriced, I mean that's probably going to persist in one form or the other. So that's sort of what I do now. I identify and trade risk premium. What I love about what you just said is that you really define what your style and what your strategy is. You know exactly what it is. I mean, I don't know what else to say about it. I think that so many people when they're looking to build strategies, don't necessarily even know what their strategy is. Like, I mean, for example, it's like, okay, everybody goes through this where you look at all the indicators. I'm going to buy fibs. Oh no, I'm going to look at uh, momentum, RSI, all these different things. And they're not really sure what style type of trader they are. Like for me, if somebody asks me right away, I say, look at, I trade, support and resistance based upon the indicator that I created, which is really using Bollinger Bands and the current volatility of the market. So I don't look at support and resistance levels based on what the market has showed us in the past, which what was support and which was was resistance. I look at what they are based on the current volatility using the Bollinger Band, and I wait to see how they react to them. And if they react well, I trade them. If they don't, uh, I don't trade them. I mean, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I mean, obviously there's more to it, but I know specifically what I'm looking for. I, I, I don't think that people really think about defining style, strategy, and then ultimately edge. I don't, I don't yeah, know that I, everybody I think thinks that way. People start from the wrong place. Exactly. They start, you know, you get some trading testing software and you're like, okay, I'm going to try moving averages. And you try a whole bunch of different kinds of moving averages and you find one that works and then you're going to trade it. And I guarantee it won't work going forward because all you've really done is sort of you've data mined something till you found something that happened to work in the past. Now, obviously, that's a simplified example. But the thing to do is to identify a real phenomena that exists independent of the details of how you're going to trade it. So, you know, if, you, if your strategy only works by using a 15 period SMA, that's not a strategy. But if you've got something and you're like, okay, in these situations, markets trend, markets trend is a fairly sort of uh, measurement in specific observation. Once you've got that observation, then you can apply techniques to it. But there's nothing magic about a Bollinger Band or a moving average. I mean, all they do is sort of, well, you know, they they parameterize or measure a market effect. If the market effect's not there, like, you know, if, if things don't trend, then your trend-following system's not going to work. So the thing to do is identify something that trends based on a whole bunch of different – definitions like moving averages, momentum, um, I don't know, breakouts. There's a whole bunch of things. If all of them point to the same thing, then you get into the indicators. You don't just start indicator mining. You know, you and you've said basically support and resistance, which kind of like, okay, you believe the market mean reverts within certain ranges Bingo. and you've figured out a way to measure those ranges. Exactly. Now That's pretty much I could it. I could I could come to that conclusion and then parameterize it differently and make money as well. But we're starting at the point, the observation, the phenomenon is the important thing. Yeah. I mean, that's so well said. And it reminds me a lot of my conversation with uh, Dan Gramza, where we, where we talked a lot about transforming a technique into a strategy. I want to get back to your book a little bit. You're a numbers guy, but you, you, you're straight to the point. I think that you really do help traders with the with the learning curve of like, okay, where do I start and how do I end up defining this edge and going about you know, building that strategy? And I want to go back to the book because that's coming out, uh, and I know that uh, a lot of people are interested in it. And what are some of the things in the book that a trader should be anticipating or that they're going to learn about? Okay, so apart from the stuff we've talked about so far, which I think is very important, 
And it kind of leads to the general concept that, look, I'm not an options trader. I'm a trader who happens to trade options because they are the best way to express the phenomena I've found. So I think a lot of trades, even if they trade futures or stocks, <laughs> not to blow my own horn, but if they don't get anything out of the book, that's sort of more on them than on me. Because a lot of what I've said is completely general to all kinds of trading. Um, so a specific example of where I get into technical stuff is with trade sizing, um, particularly the Kelly criterion, which like the efficient market hypothesis is one of these things that's often criticized by people who don't really understand it. Um, so I've got a, probably the most mathematically technical chapter is on that. Explain that a little bit more, what the Kelly criterion is. Okay, the Kelly criterion lets you calculate the fraction of your account that you should bet in order to maximize your growth rate of the account, or equivalently maximize the final median value of the account. Um, so that's it. It's really just a sizing scheme, and it's optimal in that sense. So when people say it doesn't work, often they've either misunderstood the math or that they're hoping for it to do something that it was never really designed to do. Like if you want to limit drawdowns, well, I mean, it doesn't do that. It does exactly what it says it's going to do, but I can't tell you that that's what you want it to do. You know, we all have different ideas about risk. We can all agree on returns, but risk means different things to different people. Yeah, my theory when people say says something doesn't work, it's it just means that it doesn't it didn't work for you. I mean, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. Yeah, <laughs> I look at it. It goes back to a lot of the things that we talked about today. I mean, self awareness. Who are you as a trader? I mean, a lot of things work for a lot of people, and a lot of things don't work for a lot of people. <laughs> um, another thing that you talk about, I know that's that's in this book is. How you say that you think a lot of traders think that their edge is in discipline. And it's one of my pet peeves. People <laughs> say, people say, be disciplined. It's like, okay, yeah, to what? I mean, it's just as like, I could go on and talk about that. But I, obviously, I want to hear what you, what you think about it. Well, it, it is an example of psychology, but I think it's kind of an amusing one. Um, yeah, it's like if you are very disciplined in executing something that doesn't work, you're going to lose money in a very consistent and disciplined manner. Your discipline's not an edge. It's a way you can execute your edge. I heard some boxer express it once. He said, someone said, oh, your opponent's really tough. And he said, well, that doesn't matter because he's not that good. All that means is he's going to get beaten up more. You know, you put me in the ring with this boxer, he hits me once and I'm unconscious. This other guy is going to get beaten up for 20 minutes before he gets knocked unconscious. So discipline's kind of like that. If you, if you have the other stuff in place, then yeah, that's great, but it won't do it on its own. And anyone who thinks it does has never been on a trading floor. I mean, <laughs> so true. God, some, some of the animals you see on trading floors are about the least disciplined, most chaotic people ever. You know, if you want someone disciplined, go and, I don't know, meet an ER nurse you know, or a Marine or a, meet the guy who works the late night shift at McDonald's and the stuff he has to put up with without going nuts. That's discipline, but it doesn't mean they can trade. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. I think that for me, one of the big things I'm disciplined to is, is constantly going over everything I'm doing and constantly going over how things are going and not just saying discipline to one specific way that I'm trading because as the markets evolve and change, I'm always adapting with my strategy as to how the environment is going back to what I said about my drawdown. If I would have just continued to be disciplined in trading my strategy, even though I did say I was over trading a little bit at the time, my strategy just wasn't working at that time. I had to have that awareness, sit back, regroup, look what was going on, understand the environment and you know, go back to uh, kind of figuring things out and, and finding rhythm again. I mean, I know that you're a numbers guy, Ewan, but do you do that as well? Do you look at environments? Do you go back and look at everything that you're doing and are you constantly refining it or is it so numbers based that it's just like, this is it. I just, 
I just grind it out through this strategy? Well, I mean, no, the number, numbers change as well. So you've got to keep on running the data. And even if you're not using like, I don't know, and it, even if you're not using an explicit adaptive form of mathematics, you have to adapt. Yeah. So, you know, my what I did in March was very different from what I did in 2015. Um, and, but that comes through through in the math. You know, it should be it should be able to take in, that into account. It's not you don't just quantify something and leave it alone. I mean, I I don't know anyone who could do that that finds something so unchanging that that would work. Um, so yeah, I, I think that is something. I think that's something any strategy has to go through. And you know, if you're doing it based purely on feel, which I I feel most of the people who think they have feel are deluding themselves and just use it as an excuse to not actually do real work. But I do think there are some people who genuinely have it. You know, maybe one or two percent of traders who think they operate that way really can. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to say that doesn't exist. I think it's rare. Yeah. And I, th I think there are much, if, if that's the way you think you're going to make money trading, I think you're probably going to lose. I think there are much more consistent, learnable ways to make money than that. Well, I think for like going back to myself, cause that's all I can really talk about is, well, I'm, I'm more of a discretionary approach. Okay. I do have some stats that I have looked at and studied a lot over the years on my strategy. So I know that I have some statistical edge with the way that it works, but going back to my drawdown, why I stopped was because I don't want to say feel was a part of it, but it was, I was just, I, I recognized I was executing poorly. So that is kind of feel, but then also the market gives me all the feedback that I need to, to see. Uh, because if I am, continuing to not trade well and my P&L is not going up, <laughs> I am I am going back to the drawing board and saying, what are you doing wrong? I mean, statistically, I know that I'm losing now more than what my edge is. So now, okay, what do I need to do to fix it? But how do you do that? I mean, because like I said, for me, I am more on the discretionary approach, no doubt. You're more on the stat side. So how are you identifying it before it's, I don't want to say too late, but before you maybe give too much back and then it's like, okay, well, what's next? Yeah, and I, I don't want to give the impression that, you know, because I trade based on stats, I never have a bad day or never deviate from the strategy. I, I, I will deviate from the strategy in different ways. Like I'll still, the trades will still go in, but you know, if I'm having a bad day, I'm, I might not be putting the same effort in, you know, to research or to, you know, programming. I mean, it's like any other job. You have good days and bad days on the job. Um, and that's to be expected. I mean, we're human, but what I don't ever accept is when someone who's like, oh, I've got traders block. I can't do a trade. I mean, that's just bullshit. If you're a plumber, you don't get plumbers block. You know, you do your job. And if you want to make money as a trader, you treat it like a job and you, you manage to deal with that or otherwise you get a different profession. But with regard to your specific question, I mean, there are mathematical techniques for doing exactly that. And it comes down to the, you know, even if you're not using, the, well, the one I use the Kolmogorov Smirnoff test, if anyone wants to get technical. But even if you're not using that, like you said, you're now, you knew you were losing more than your edge was. Well, the only way you know that is if you keep records. Yes. You know, and every That's trader true. in the world thinks and is told the most important thing is to keep records. But it's one of those things, very few people actually do it. You know, I I can't look back. When I was a market maker, obviously, I couldn't look at any in, every individual trade I did because there were thousands of them a day. But you can look back at the sort of the aggregate statistics, and you've got to be able to keep records of those and then look at them and see how they change over time. And, you know, if the amount of bid-ask spread you're getting is a tenth of what it used to be, you've got to be aware of that. 
I mean, maybe it's not a problem because your volume's gone up by 10, but you've got to know what's happening. And the only way you know what's happening is by keeping track of it all. And, you know, in your, in your case, maybe you have to keep track of, you know, other stuff as well, like your mood. Did you get enough sleep? Yeah. You know, are you concentrating enough? Did you have a hangover? I don't have to do that, <laughs> but I have to keep track of other stuff. Yeah, no, I, I think you're nailing it. I mean, I, I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, the reason I know that obviously the drawdown was getting a little worse is because I looked at – I'll tell everybody what I did. So here, here's how – I recognized that I was losing more than my statistical edge. So I did something years ago as I actually automated my top looks, my favorite setups, and not that I ran them on automation, but what I could do with them was see how they were performing. So what I do is I'll run a test and say, okay, how has this look been? And I could tweak it as much as I want and say, just look at the buys, just look at the sells. Because I know that in certain environments, I'm only looking at one side. In certain environments, I'm looking at both sides of the market. So I could tweak it. And in that moment, I looked at everything and said, man, you're just, if you were just doing your favorite setups and just executing them in the bare bones basics, you'd be doing way better than the way you are right now. That's also how I recognized I was over trading. It's also recognized, I mean, not just, not, also, but it was, I knew I was trading poorly, but it did help to, to identify it. And, and that to me is just something that I lean on. Does that make sense? Kind of what I did where it's like, I, I automated it, but it's, I'm not trading it. I actually did it to see how I was performing versus if I had it automated. Um, well, yeah, I can't really tell you if that makes sense because I'm not sure enough of your strategy to know if that was the correct thing to keep records of. Yeah. But, but you, you, absolutely have to if you hadn't kept records in some sense you if you don't know how you're doing you can't improve you know and i don't i don't mean like oh i'm trading well i'm trading badly it's like okay what do you mean by that you know when when are you trading well are you trading the first half hour well and then things go badly are you are your entries great are your exits great tell me more if you can't give me the details you know uh, your opinion it's just an opinion you know, and that that's just really not going to be something you can build on and improve on. Great points today, you and uh, I loved having this conversation of where just different viewpoints and just hearing from both of our experiences and and looking forward to reading your new book. And why don't we, before we let you go, first give everybody a place where they could find you on social media, and also tell us where they can buy the book. Um, okay, so the book. I don't know if you gave the full title. The book is Positional Options Trading, an Advanced Guide. And I mean, it is fairly advanced. I've written it for people who've been trading for a while. I haven't really defined a lot of the basic options terms. Uh, you can find it on Amazon, finally. Uh, there have been some supply issues because of COVID, but now everything's come together. Uh, the best place to find me on social media is on Twitter. Uh, my handle is Sinclair Ewan. Um, E-U-A-N. And uh, yeah, I'm usually reasonably good at answering questions. Yeah, no, you're good. And and I tell you what, you're, you're a good guy. You get right to the point with your stuff. I love having discussions with you. I always learn something. Ewan, thank you so much for joining me today on Futures Radio Show. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review on iTunes. You can listen to all of our episodes on FuturesRadioShow.com, iTunes, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher.